Okay. Um, there are a number of uh, there's several counties in Maryland where there's a large um, a large number of perennial fruit producers, but uh, the fact is that many of you may have one or two producers in your county, and you may from time to time be uh, um, uh, sought out by them to get their nutrient management plan. And so we're going to talk about the, the things we have to take into account when we do a nutrient management plan for a perennial fruit crop because it's really a very different ball game, a very different paradigm than what we're used to. I think most of us are, in fact, uh, much more familiar with the production of annual crops than we are of, of perennial crops, particularly perennial fruit crops. So let's talk about uh, the differences uh, between an annual crop and a perennial crop, in this case, a perennial fruit crop. First of all, there's differences in, in root morphology, and uh, they tend to have, tree fruits in particular, tend to have very deep root systems. And all of the perennial fruits, whether it's a small fruit or a tree fruit, often have mycorrhizal colonization on their roots. And I'm going to come back in a moment and talk more about the mycorrhizal colonization because I think it's fascinating. But let's just go with the fact now that the roots are deep. Right? In addition, because these plants are perennial, they have a way of actually storing nutrients within the plant from year to year. Uh, some materials are translocated to the roots. Some are stored in the bark. And so the, uh, there are, uh, they're, they're not relying upon what's being supplied to them in the soil throughout their entire life cycle. In some stages, they're re in some cases, they're recycling stuff that they've taken up previous years. These crops also have a longer life cycle. Uh, apples tend to have the longest. Um, you can have 20 plus years on an apple tree stand. Peaches tend to be less long because they tend to run into disease problems. Um, disease tends, diseases and nematodes tend to be the things that take out fruit crops. So the soil testing that we typically do for annual crops, where we look at a soil test from a 0 to 8 inch depth, uh, certainly can't be considered to reflect the true availability of what's going on in a tree that has deep roots and is 15 years old, for example. Right? And the fact is, is that fruit scientists um, have, have worked through protocols to use what's in the tissue or tissue analysis for making recommendations for mature trees and mature small fruit plantings. That's really much more informative in many cases than what's in the soil test in um, the 0 to 8 inch um, slice. So this is what we're going to talk about over the next um, 45 or 50 minutes. Now I want to come back to this mycorrhizae thing because these are fascinating creatures. Um, mycorrhizae is actually the name for a relationship, a symbiotic relationship between certain fungi and the roots of higher plants. Right? And the mycorrhizae themselves are the specialized root, or, root uh, organs. Here, all right. This is this is a fungus. Okay, these are both funguses. And notice that they actually uh, grow into the root. Okay, they invade the root. All right. well, you might say, oh, this is bad. But in this case, it isn't. It isn't bad at all. This is a symbiotic relationship. Remember that that means it's a positive relationship for both creatures involved. It's positive for the fungus, and it's positive for the tree. Right? The fact is that the, the plant does, in fact, provide some photosynthate some energy compounds, but the uh, fungus, in this case, typically grows far out into the soil, far greater in distance than the root itself grows. In some cases where people have dug up these plants and measured the roots, and that comes second only to looking for mineral particles in manure samples for tediousness, they have found that these mycorrhizae can extend meters out beyond where the root extends. And these, uh, the fungi component of the mycorrhizae association can actually take up water and nutrients from those great distances away and transport it back through their system to the root. So the payoff for the tree is they get nutrients and water that they would not ordinarily get if they only had their own roots because these other critters are living with them, extending far beyond, far a greater distance out into the soil and transporting water and nutrients back. So it's a real win-win for both. So perennial fruit crops really do follow a different paradigm. We don't have a pre-plant soil test, put the 
nutrients on, come back and harvest it in four, five, six months. In fact, in fact, we have to actually um, cut the uh, life cycle of the plant into four different stages. There's bio-renovation, which is suggested to get the soil ready for this crop that's going to be grown for a long period of time. There's pre-plant, what we do to get ready. This, in a sense, is similar to what we do for annual crops. There's the non-bearing years, where the plant is growing, but it's not growing the fruit yet. And then there's the bearing years, where you're actually getting the fruit crop. So we're going to think about what these periods look like for two of the major fruit crops, and then go on to how we manage during each of these time periods. Okay? First of all, we have a lot of information on our website about uh, the perennial fruit crops. We have something called Perennial Fruit One, which um, gives an overview of the concepts one needs to be familiar with if you're a producer of these crops or someone doing a plan for them. We have PF2, perennial fruit 2, which talks about tissue and soil sampling. And then we have a bulletin called NM5, which um, goes through some of the same information and above in a lot more detail, and also has tables where the recommendations are published. Right? All of these are on our website. Right? Then there's a whole different set of publications for grapes. There's enough differences in grapes that they are handled by um, different people and have different pubs. There's the Wine Grape Production Guide for Eastern North America. And this contains the recommendations for bearing vines. There is a publication on tissue sampling for vineyards. It's an information sheet. There's some information on pre-plant renovation and soil conditioning, because again, it's important to get that soil ready for these expensive plants that are going to grow a long period of time. And finally, there's a publication called Nutrient Management for Grapes that has information about establishment and the non-bearing years. Now, this one is double-starred because it's not on anybody's website right now. It's currently being revised, but we hope to have it back on a website. And when it is, we will link to it from ours. Now, I want to go out for a moment to our website and show you, um, familiarize you with it for those of you that don't go to it very often. So I'm going to share my computer screen. OK, here we are at the Nutrient Management Program website. Um, the publications can be found here under Publications. And um, we'll go there for a sec. If you go to Orchards. NM5. Hang, um, hang on, Trish. We're not okay. seeing it. Oh, OK. Sorry. Can you see it now, Heather? Yes. OK, good. So let me go yeah, back. If, if anyone can't see that, would you put up a red X for us? OK, well, I want to point out two places where you'll find information. One is under Publications. All right, Go to Publications, Orchards, and you'll find uh, a number of things that will help you develop a plan. Another place where you'll find some worksheets that will help you will be under Plan Writing Tools, Tissue Sampling, and Testing. All right. Collection cards are here. Uh, summary sheets are here. Now I'm going back to the connect. OK. Go ahead and pull up your document again. Pull it up from the beginning? From the beginning, Heather? Yeah, I'll navigate it to I'll navigate to where you need. Okay. Sorry, I thought this would be a little easier to do. Now, for those of you that don't go to the website or haven't learned its um, construction to find things, please spend a couple minutes on it. We work very hard to make it a complete source of information for you and to use that as a a very important communication tool for you in terms of um, finding the information you need. 
Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So we have sources of information for for the tree fruit and most of the small fruit. And then there's other information if you're doing plants for great producers. OK. So remember, this is um, a whole cycle of many years. Typically, it takes a year or two to, uh, to renovate a site, that is, to get it ready for production. Remember that these plant materials are very expensive, and you want to get things in great shape before you plant them. Then there's what would be considered your non-bearing years. These are years when the, the plants are in, but you're not getting harvestable material, or you're not getting very much yet. And then finally, there's the bearing years. Okay? And you can see in the peach rotation that a peach stand lands, lasts about 12 years. You have similar um, periods in your rotation for apples, but it's a much longer crop. I can only assume that it's able to handle the, the, the environmental conditions of uh, root nematodes and diseases better than peaches, and thus we get longer stands. But in all cases, bio-renovation is recommended. You, you'll have planting here, so you'll make your pre-plant actions here. You'll have non-bearing years, and then you'll have bearing years. There's additional information you're going to have to uh, collect for perennial fruit that you might not be accustomed to. Of course, we always need to know what the producers call on the farm and what the field is called, how many acres it is, what crop he's growing, what his yield is, what his tillage is. But in this case, you're going to want to specifically know what production stage that field is in. And you're going to want to chat with them about other things, like how well the crop is doing, and is he getting a lot of growth or not enough growth, or are there any production problems that your producer's been able to identify. So there's a little bit different paradigm in terms of the information that you're going to collect. All right. During the bio-renovation stage, the point is to get your soil in good shape. That's going to mean the production of certain specific crops to meet your goals. You want to get your fertility in great shape, but you also want to reduce your nematode population if you believe you have a problem with that or if there's a, um, a, a record of having problems with that. For example, you would never take a peach stand out, cut it down, and plant in peaches the next year. Peaches are um, very prone to nematode damage, and you would need to bio-renovate before you planted that area again. So you're going to soil test to find out what the crop you're going to grow needs, and then you're going to grow it for whatever it's going to do for you. Brassicas are grown if you have a nematode problem. They've been shown to actually uh, reduce nematode population as a result of their breakdown products. These contain compounds that, when they break down, produce hydrocyanic acid. So it's, a, a, it's, it's as effective as some um, chemical crop um, material, crop protected materials, just to grow this crop. Some people have problems with low organic matter and have a lot of soil compaction problems that they want to deal with. And in that case, the, Sudan, the sorghum Sudan cross is very good at doing both, uh, reducing compaction and supplying organic matter. And some growers actually want to generate some income that year. They're not getting the income from the fruit, and they need the income from something else. And so they grow a crop that will actually generate some income, like either grain corn or sweet corn. And the recs for all these crops can be found in Newman. So if you're doing bio-renovation recommendations, you can be using Newman to get that information. Then there's the pre-plant stage. So perhaps you've bio-renovated for a year or two. Maybe you put in a year of brassicas to knock down the nematodes, and then a year of uh, uh, sorghum sudan grass to build up the organic matter. You want to come back and soil test again and see how things are before you put those expensive plants in. And you want to adjust the pH and get the P and K up um, so that it's where those plants need to be during their bearing years. Now, there's a difference of opinion about this, but some Fruit experts say that this is when you put your P and K down, and then your your tree mines it for the rest of the cycle. All right. Others say no, no, no. You might need to implement as you um, supplement as you go along. It's like a lot of other things. There, it's not a whole lot of agreement. At any rate, during the pre-plant stage, there is no uh, nitrogen applied. The nitrogen is applied after the planting. Right. So if you want recommendations for um, apples in a pre-plant stage or peaches in a pre-plant stage, they, in fact, um, are also found in Newman. And they'll only be P and K recs and, and uh, lime recs. There will not be a nitrogen rec. You don't put nitrogen down now. You put it down after the plant is established. Okay. Then there's the non-bearing stage. And lucky for planters, there's no assessment tool used during this stage. 
no soil test, no plant analysis. There's simply a specific amount of nitrogen and nitrogen only that is put around those um, young plantings in a precision placement. Okay. And the recommendations for how much you put out is dependent upon the species, and it can be found in the publication recs. It can be found in NM5 for everything but grapes, for example. Then there's the bearing stage, and this is when things get complicated. You have two assessment tools now. Now you need both tissue analysis and soil tests. So the goal here, you want to maintain a good balance between the vegetative growth and the reproductive growth. That's the fruit, all right? And what you need to understand is low fertility is going to reduce your yields, okay? Excessive fertility is going to lead to a lot of growth, a lot of vegetative growth, but it isn't going to increase yield, and it is going to increase the labor costs of pruning, right? What you want is adequate fertility. You want to maintain good crop, crop quality, but you want to minimize the pruning. And in the words of Dr. Chris Walsh, who's our fruit specialist here at University of Maryland, you want fruit, not lumber. Right? So you want adequate but not excessive fertility. Well, he did a study over at the Y on peaches, and uh, this in is information he used several years ago at the, at the Hershey meeting the fruit growers meeting, and uh, this was a result of a several year study where they had fertilized peaches with urea, right? and they looked at three rates of nitrogen. They looked at a 40 pound per acre, uh, an 80 pound per acre, and 135 pounds per acre. And what we have here is the leaf analysis, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the calcium. And you can see that at the low rate, you had a nitrogen percentage dry weight leaf of 2.75, it increased to 3.15 when you added the 80 pound rate, and it increased to 3.31 when you added the 135 pound rate. You didn't see any, any meaningful difference in the phosphorus, of course, because you didn't add any phosphorus. Okay? But notice that the calcium did um, tend to drop when you increased the rate over low. Um, I will say that a lot of fruit people actually use calcium nitrate and not urea. And, and I'm not exactly sure why Dr. Walsh used you on this one. Anyway, interesting results. Uh, look at fruit rate, how many grams uh, on average fruit weighs, the average weight per fruit. Uh, the bigger the fruit, the more price you can get for it, the better grade it is, the better quality it is. And they also looked at the yield. So at the low nitrogen rate, the average fruit weight was 157 grams. At the um, normal nitrogen rate for peaches, it was 172, and for the high, it was 170. So I think you can see that, that increasing your nitrogen rate more did not increase your fruit size. I'm going to say, he didn't supply any statistics to this, but I'm going to think that this probably wasn't significant, and it certainly isn't meaningful. And then over here on the how many, how many uh, kilograms did you get per tree, you got 68.5 grams at low fertility. 80 and a half grams at uh, normal fertility and 78 and a half at high. Again, probably not a significant difference, certainly not a meaningful difference. You can see that the high rate didn't increase your fruit size. It didn't increase your yield. What it did increase is the amount of pruning you had to do and the amount of money you had to spend or time you had to spend uh, in pruning those trees because of the excessive growth. So this just kind of reinforces the idea you don't want inadequate fertility or low fertility. You don't want excess fertility. It doesn't do you any good. It doesn't get you more fruit. doesn't make you more money from selling it. And it could cost you a lot more in your labor costs for pruning. What you want is optimum. All right. So the first thing we have to do before we start getting into the bearing stage protocols is realize that we've got a concept called blocks. We have management units for annual crops. We have blocks for perennial fruit crops. Right, so we need to define a block. Um, then we need to select a species and a variety for sampling. We need to sample the plant tissue. And we need to sample the soil. So first, what is a block? It's an area within an orchard that consists of plants that you've planted at the same time. They're the same age. They're the same species. And they're the same variety. A block should have similar or the same soil types. And it's going to be managed as a unit. And since uh, many of us can't tell when we go out to a planting the differences in varieties, I know I can't, um, this can only, you can only figure out what a block is by working with the orchard manager. I know I can't tell one kind of apple from another until the apples ripen. Some of you may be better at that, but I'm sure not. 
All right. So here's the hypothetical area in an orchard. Okay. Uh, we can see we've got a road. We've got plantings on both sides. On one side, we have gala apples and some golden delicious. On the east side of the road, we have some more golden delicious, and we have some Fujis. Um, then there's a creek. Then we've got some more Fujis, and we've got some cherries. Okay, So hmm, where are the blocks? Well, you need to chat with the orchard manager and find out uh, what the age of the plantings is. Okay, And in fact, the um, the trees on the west side of the road were planted four years ago. They've just come, come into bearing. The trees on the east side of the road are older. They were planted seven years ago. Right? So all of these are seven years. These are four years. We also have some soil differences. We have a morel uh, gravelly loam um, on the west side and up to the creek on the east side. And then we've got a thermot gravelly loam over here. There are some fairly significant differences in profile features here. They are not similar in productivity, and we should not be um, acting as if they are. So we've got a number of different blocks here. We not only have different um, species, we have different varieties, we have different soils, and we have different ages. So in, in fact, um, we can sample the field uh, to the west of the road. Um, we can consider that one block, block A. Uh, they're the same age. The Golden Delicious and the Gala are the same age. And that soil is mapped fairly uniformly on this side of the road. On the, on the east side of the road, these trees are older, but it's still morel gravelly loam. So even though it's the same soil complex, uh, they're not the same age crop. We're going to sample this separately. And finally, we're going to sample uh, a third block over here, probably the Fuji apples on the Thermont gravelly loam. Seven years old, but a different soil than the soil here. So um, if there are differences in, in, in species, differences in soils, differences in age, we need to sample separately. So the general guidelines um, for um, for sampling are this. Um, there was a lot of concern when nutrient management uh, regulations passed in 98 as to how it would affect our fruit growers. The, the thought was, this is a very expensive sample. Um, might cost you 20 30 $35 to get one sample done. What about people that have lots and lots of um, varieties in, in what we might consider one block. You know, it's the same soil, it's the same age. What Dr. Walsh has suggested is that you select the um, either the uh, variety or the species that is most valuable to you. You sample that, and the gen and the what you learn from that particular variety or species, you extrapolate to the other varieties in your block. So, for example, to go back to that other one. Um, there's Golden Delicious and there's Fuji apples in this block. Um, the Fujis are worth a lot more money, um, perhaps. If that's the case, you might take your sample from them, but generalize the results to everything. Or maybe you make more money from your Golden Delicious, and you certainly have more of them. So maybe you'd sample that that variety and extrapolate to the Fuji. So that's kind of a question that needs to be answered by your producer. Which one's more important to them? Which one's more valuable? And I would certainly go towards that one um, and then generalize to the other. And over here, we've got galas and golden delicious. I remember Dr. Walsh saying that galas uh, were more valuable. I guess you can get more per pound for them. So you'd probably sample the galas, not the golden delicious, but what you find on the galas, you're going to extrapolate to the golden delicious because you've treated them both the same last year anyway. They've gotten the same fertility regime. And if this one's optimum, that one's probably optimum. If this one's deficient, that one's probably deficient. Okay. OK, so sample at least one variety or species from every bearing block. You need to collect those tissue samples within a recommended time frame. And remember that nutrient composition of virtually any plant is going to change throughout the season. In the case of perennial fruit, the I'll use the term calibration for good, bad, and indifferent nutrient content um, is, is, um, is known across the season, and we need to sample when things are relatively uniform within the plant. All right, So it's important to take the sample at the right time. If you don't take it at the right time, there's no sense of taking it at all, because you can't use that information to do an interpretation. You also need to sample from the right plant part. 
In some cases, it's leaf and petiole. In some cases, it's leaf only. In some cases, it's petiole only. So be sure you've looked at your information to see what the particular plant part is. And then you're going to take a number of samples. And you're not going to take them from all from the same tree. You're going to take probably no more than one or two per tree across the block. You want a wide selection of plants from throughout the block. I probably would not take more than two leaves per tree. And ideally, you want to take them in an unbiased or what we might think of as a random basis. All right? If there are um, disease, um, leaves that are diseased, you want to avoid them. They're going to, their nutrient content could easily be messed up because of the disease. So you want to avoid diseased tissue. OK? So you need to sample at least one variety of your species at the right time, the right part, take enough samples, and take those samples from a wide variety of plants throughout the block. Now, we've got some diagrams in the two uh, perennial fruit bulletins that I talked about. If you want more information or if you've never done a plan like this and you need to, go back and read those publications over. So sample collection summary, this is taken from our sample collection uh, card. Um, um, blueberries, first week of harvest. The others are taken later in the, sumble, in the summer. Brambles, this is your uh, raspberries, blackberries um, in August. Tree fruit, mid-September, pretty much to Labor Day. Right? Um, 40 leaves, take the petioles off. 60 leaves, take the petioles off. 50 leaves and petioles. This is important. Follow, follow what it says, because remember, the interpretive guidance has been developed using these plant parts. So it's very important to follow the protocol. Blueberries, current season growth. Brambles, you want um, the most recent fully expanded leaf on the primocane. That's the new cane that the um, plant put out this year. It's not the canes that are bearing the fruit. It's the new cane, the primocane, first year cane. And the fruit trees, you want to select shoots from eye level around the outside of the tree at a specific angle. And you want to remove one or two leaves only from the mid portion of the current season's growth. When I first heard this, I went, good grief. OK, so um, I'll explain to you how I work through this dilemma. First of all, um, we can tell what the current season growth is. All right, because every year is demarcated by something called the bud scale scars, and I'm showing them here. All right, these are the bud scale scars. The first bud scale scars you run into when you come down from the tip. This represents the beginning of this year's growth, and when this bud scale open, when this bud opens up next year, it will leave bud scale scars, which will delineate the beginning of next year's growth. So if the directions say to collect one or two leaves per tree from the mid portion, we're talking about these, midway between here and here. Right? When you're looking at a tree like this, OK, you got to come up close. You can't tell anything from this distance. But come up, look at the tip, follow it back to where you see the bud scale scars. And that's your current season's growth. And here they are. This isn't some silly drawing. This is an actual photo. They're concentric rings. And I think it's pretty clear here, but it's even more clear if you actually have a real uh, perennial planting. You can see where, where each season's growth is. If this was a poorly fertilized apples like the ones I have at my place, the bud scale scars are all crunched together because the apples weren't fertilized over the years and there's not much growth. But these are the bud scale scars for this current year's growth. So it's relatively easy. You can actually see this on a real plant. Okay. So sample instruction cards. Um, the data I just showed you came from this instruction card, Sample Collection and Preparation for Perennial Fruits. It's on the website under the plan writing tools. This is good for tree fruit, brambles, that's blueberries and blackberries, and blueberries. All right. There's also tissue sampling for vineyards um, for that. and um, both, both of those can be found on this page. Now, how do you prepare the samples for shipment? Most labs want the samples in a paper bag so that the samples can breathe while they're being shipped. You want to be sure to label the bag with the block and the variety name. 
and be sure that the label is the same. If you're calling it field one or block one, be sure it's the same as on your map. Remember, we want consistency between the analytical data report and your map. You probably want to allow the sample to dry for a couple days in an open bag to when it's kind of crispy or crunchy. Right? And you want to tape or staple the bag closed and ship it to the lab. Right? I remember a lab calling me a couple years ago. They got a box of samples. So the bags hadn't been closed tightly. By the time the sample got to the lab, there was just a whole bunch of stuff in the bottom of the box and a bunch of labs with labels. Okay? So it's important to either tape that bag closed or staple it before you send it off. You want it open when it's drying, but you don't want it, you don't want it open when you're shipping it. The only exception to wanting dry samples is agri-analysis. If your client uses that, they actually want fresh samples. Uh, so you're probably going to want to ship them as soon as possible after sampling. Uh, do keep them cool if they're not going to be shipped right away so that they don't dry out or mold. Now, many agricultural testing labs offer tissue uh, testing in addition to soil testing and manure testing and other things. Uh, and I will say that the laboratory techniques for tissue analysis are quite standardized. Uh, that is to say, any lab is going to use a, a very similar method for analyzing your plant tissue. Much like manure analysis, um, what you want is the mineral content uh, of this of the sample, so laboratories are going to burn off the organic matter either with very high heat or very very strong acids, and get the the um, inorganic elements into solution and analyze that. So there's very little variability in a practical sense from the methods that will be used. That's good for us because that means that the laboratory results, the analytical results, the percent of the nutrients is similar across labs. We don't have to do any funky lab conversions. And what they typically measure is the total elemental content, percent P, percent K, percent calcium. Okay? The results are either expressed in percent, if you're dealing with the macronutrients, it'd be percent nitrogen, percent potassium, or parts per million if it's a micronutrient, so percent iron and percent copper. But the results, the analytical results from different labs are similar. Right? The recommendations probably are but the analytical results are. Right. We do uh, keep a sheet on our website that compares the different uh, testing labs that are used in this region and does have their price. And you can see that $24, $28, uh, these are expensive samples. It's a lot more than soil testing. But that's because uh, much more uh, lab strenuous equipment needed to be used to get this analysis. It's not just a simple shake with a dilute acid with some chemicals in the way it is for soil testing. Does the choice of a lab make a difference to a person doing a plan for them? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, several, well, a number of years ago now, probably 15 years ago, when, when we were formulating the tissue recommendations for Maryland, Dr. Walsh relied upon the Penn State recommendations as a starting point and modified them as he saw fit. And Penn State actually agreed to give a University of Maryland recommendation for tissue reports that have a Maryland address. And that's true for everything except grapes. So if your client sends their tissue samples to Penn State, you will get back the Maryland recommendation. If, if your client sends the tissue to any other lab, you're going to have to determine the recommendation for each nutrient yourself. And I'll give you an example of how we do that in, for one nutrient in just a moment. So unless it's a Penn State analysis, I want to reinforce that you cannot assume that the interpretation or the recommendation is consistent with NM5. Right? The analytical results are comparable across labs, but the interpretations, is it high, is it low, is it excessive, is it deficient, and the recommendations, how much nutrient should I put on, are not necessarily consistent. And the burden is going to be on you as a planner to develop the recommendation from published guidance if your client doesn't use Penn State. All right, so here's an example of a summary sheet for a perennial fruit crop. And this is on our website at the address um, Heather gave a moment ago. And uh, there's a whole bunch of nutrients that are analyzed for in plant tissue. You're going to have concentrations in the plant, 
relative level in the plant, deficient, low, medium, high, relative level in the soil, and then the recommendation. And you're going to have to fill this out yourself if this, in fact, is coming from a lab other than Penn State. But the Word document with the guts of this table is on our website should you need it. OK, so how do we develop recommendations for perennial fruit crops? Well, I will say that the recommendations are based primarily on plant tissue. And the soil tests are used for either clarification or confirmation. And I'll try to give you a sense of that in a moment. OK, here's an example of one crop and one nutrient, apples, phosphorus. Okay, And I've taken this out of NM5 on page 19, uh, which has a little bit more verbiage over here. But in essence, it's telling you that if it's apples and if it's phosphorus, and it's less than 0.10%, phosphorus is deficient. If it's between 0.11 and 0.12, phosphorus is low. If it's between 0.15 and 0.31, it's normal. And if it's higher than 0.31, it's high. So if you got an apple tissue sample from another lab and we're looking at the phosphorus component of it, you could tell the relative level, deficient, low, normal, or high, by comparing the phosphorus level on your tissue report to these concentrations here. Then based on these, con these um, levels, there's a recommendation. If your phosphorus in those apple tissues had greater than 0.31% phosphorus, there's no further phosphorus application needed. But if they're less than 0.11, you need 150 pounds of phosphorus per acre, assuming it's consistent with the phosphorus site index. That is, your phosphorus site index isn't a very high. OK, so let's, let's look at how the, these data play out. We'll try to develop the recommendation and see how it would look on the recommendation summary sheet for phosphorus and apples. First of all, the soil test indicated that the FIVP was 95. Well, that's in the high end of the optimum range. The phosphorus uh, concentration in the tissue is 0 0.23. So what does that mean? Well, look at your phosphorus table. In fact, it's within the normal range. Let's go back a minute. 0 0.23, 0 0.23 is in here, all right? So I can normal here. What do you do in terms of phosphorus recommendations if uh, you have a normal, if you're in the normal range? You don't do anything. There's no further application required. So now that you know this, you move this information over to your summary sheet. You know it's for apples. Okay. First, you move in your analytical data, your phosphorus in the plant tissue, your relative level in the soil. Right. Then you move in the relative level, deficient, low, normal, high, whatever you're calling it. And finally, the recommendation comes right out of NM5, no further application at this time. So you can go over to NM5 on the web and block and move the recommendation out as soon as you know what category you fall in. Normal phosphorus apples, no further application at this time. So you can see where there, um, there's a lot more work to do to develop a recommendation for one field of a perennial crop if the person chooses not to use Penn State. Because you've got to go through this for every single nutrient. And we're not just talking macros. The fact is there's micronutrients here, too. And you're going to want to provide the information that's possible from them. Tissue samples are good for three years, just like soil samples, Craig. That's the interpretation that MDA um, has decided along with this. Um, a lot of um, orchardists sample their orchards on a cycle. They do a part of it every year. And so they wouldn't necessarily do the whole operation in one year, but they do about a third of it each of three years so that every area gets sampled both in soil and in tissue every three years. So what's the difference uh, about sampling soil in a perennial fruit crop? Well, your soil sample should be collected from, from each bearing block you know, each thing you defined as a block. And the soil sample should be taken from the same general area where the tissue samples were taken. 
So let's say you had a mixed block where you had um, some, a few pears and a few cherries and a lot of apples, and you sampled one of the apple um, varieties. You're going to want to take the samples near the apple varieties in the same general area where you took the tissue samples. Now, you don't necessarily need to take them in the heat of the summer. When you're taking the tissue samples, you can make note of where you took your samples and come back in the fall. Uh, we tend to get uh, more frequent rainfalls in the fall than in the summer, and the soil is less compact. You may not need a hammer to get your uh, soil probe in. So you can let the soil sampling go for um, you know, six, eight weeks and come back in the fall and take your soil samples then when the sampling is actually easier. So I, I know we said that we need both soil and tissue analysis for perennial fruit, and, and I'll give you an example of, of how that might come into play. Uh, let's, say that, let's say that your tissue analysis um, indicated that your phosphorus was deficient, all right? but your soil analysis indicated that your plant available phosphorus was in the excessive range. Let's say that, um, let's say it was an FIV of uh, 200. All right. Well, this suggests that you have a problem that's interfering with your tree or bush of fruit ability to take up the phosphorus. You, it could be nematodes, it could be a disease, but in this case, because you had enough in at least a zone of the soil, you wouldn't add more P because it clearly indicates that something's wrong with uptake, not necessarily with the amount of the phosphorus that is there. Okay. So how often do soil samples have to be collected? Um, at least every three years in, in the bearing blocks, and, and that's because the soil sample needs to be taken every three years and because the soil and the tissue meshes together in terms of making the recommendation. All right. So if you have to take soil samples every three years, you need to take tissue samples too. Obviously, if you have some nutritional problems that you're trying to correct as an orchardist, you're going to want to see whether or not what you've done last year helped. So I'm sure there are cases where people take their samples more often, especially with high value fruit crops. All right. You do need to take soil samples in the pre-plant area of orchards, and of course you do need soil samples to come up with a recommendation for your bio-renovation crops. Right. Soil and tissue testing summary, what do we need to do when? Bio-renovation, you need soil testing, that's all. Um, there isn't perennial tissue yet, so we don't need any of that. Pre-plant, we're getting ready to plant our expensive um, grafted material. Yes, we need a soil test to make any last minute adjustments in terms of pH or nutrients. No tissue exists yet, no tissue sample. Non-bearing years, they're planted, but uh, they're not bearing fruit uh, yet. Uh, we don't need soil tests, nor do we need tissue tests. This is where we apply nitrogen based on the recommendation document and the species. And in the bearing years, you need both soil tests and tissue tests because the soil tests can confirm or help you understand what's going on with the tissue tests. Summarize, we're used to the concept of management units and annual crops. This, in a, this is an area that we can manage together because we've grown the same crops in the past and it has the same fertility regime and it has a similar complex of soils and we manage them as a unit. In this case, we can actually take our soil, sample, soil samples up to several months before we plant. We've got one chance to get stuff down. It's before, for the most part, for P and K, before we plant. In some cases, most or all of our nitrogen goes down before plant two. All right? Blocks are different. These are areas that consist of plantings of the same age, species, and variety. Still, similar mosaic of soils. We manage them at one unit. In this case, the soil samples can be collected in the following fall in the same areas where the tissue samples were collected in the summer. So it's a little bit different way of thinking. I do want to say just a couple words about food safety. We're dealing here with crops that are eaten raw. And so if folks who are growing these crops aren't familiar with the general agricultural practices, and that's the buzzword for good practices for keeping your food safe from microbial outbreaks, GAPs, as opposed to BMPs, uh, there are a couple of bulletins. The one um, is this leaflet here. Uh, there's also a booklet that has a lot more detail. And the mantra is food safety begins on the farm. We have to take precautions before planting, during production, during harvest, and during post-harvest uh, treatment and uh, handling in order to keep food safe. 
Um, our recommendation is extension is that we include one of these brochures in every plan where a person is growing a crop eaten raw regardless of their nutrient source. These are available from, um, if you put in GAPS, Cornell, um, both the leaflet and the booklet are available for purchase from the GAPS program, which happens to be housed at Cornell University. Okay, so um, we got a few moments here, and I'll stay as long as I need to answer questions. Uh, Craig, drip line's not, um, not an issue here. It's the plant part as it was described in the sampling bulletin. So it's the mid leaves of this season's growth for trees. It's the first fully developed, um, fully open leaf on the primocane of brambles. Soil samples should be taken near the crop. Yeah. Yes. I would, I think within the drip line would be a good idea. Of a tree. Uh, that, that's less of a concept with brambles. Um, I grow brambles and they pretty much grow straight up. So there you'd want to get it as close as possible. 